So, um, look, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors down there, and really these are the, the people that have actually been doing a lot of the work directly with pharma groups uh, on this important issue of climate change, as, as Mark has outlined. Uh, just a quick overview. I'm, I'm going to really go through the first bit fairly quickly because people have covered it. I'm just going to talk about some of the case studies on climate change impacts we've looked at in New South Wales, some of the, some of the adaptation options. And I think there's some of the opportunities and challenges associated with climate change really around uncertainty. Um, so we're all aware of this, you know, basically we've got rising temperatures in Australia, both in terms of ocean temperatures and, and uh, land temperatures. Uh, that's been a familiar story. Uh, when we look at, uh, when you look at that in terms of probability distributions, and that one on the left there is just uh, looking at what's happening with maximum uh, monthly temperatures. You can see there that as we've actually moved over from one period, this early period, uh, uh, to a later period, to later periods, we end up moving across to the right, and so we're naturally end up going to end up with more extreme events. So that's what the observations are telling us. We actually are getting, we're getting warmer, and that's actually affecting the extremes. Uh, when you look at minimum temperatures, again, you've got a similar sort of story. So minimum temperatures are rising, maximum temperatures are rising. And when we sort of start to look at climate projections, to some extent, we're just introducing another curve that's moving out to the right. Okay, so there's nothing sort of new. It's actually just a continuation of, the, of, of that trend. Uh, again, if we have a quick look at rainfall, uh, this is uh, from the Bureau uh, and from CSIRO. You know, we've actually had reductions in, in rainfall, uh, particularly in the growing season rainfall uh, in New South Wales and, and large parts of South East Australia, particularly in WA. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is a story that, that really, if that's an indication of climate change, then it's well, well and truly with us. Uh, Mark showed this graph, and I think it's great that actually other groups other than CSIRO and BOM are actually analysing this data and saying, hey, there's actually a bit of a problem here. Um, some of this work is actually well reflected in earlier work that was done by SIACI, the Southeastern Australian Climate Initiative, which really did show, you know, some really significant changes uh, in rainfall, particular declines in autumn, uh, winter and spring. So, you know, when you look at those sort of charts, you start to think, well, okay, there's a bit of a story there and how do we actually adapt to it? Does it mean in a livestock sense we actually have to, you know, we're going to have, we're going to need to actually have some tropical species, you know, developing in sort of central and southern New South Wales and is that feasible? So it starts to trigger some questions when you start looking at these trends. Um, and so the projections, you know, Australian temperatures are continue, continue to warm. This is straight from the Bureau and from CSIRO. You know, further increase in some of the extreme events like we showed in the observations. Uh, average rainfall in southern Australia is, is projected to, do, to decrease with some increase in drought frequency. Although we're less, I guess we're less certain about the rainfall story. It's very clear about the temperature story. So a couple of things that I really wanted to cover uh, today was really just looking at some of the things we've actually found um, in, in our work that we've done uh, in climate change. Um, a couple of sites we're going to look at is just uh, in Tamora and Condobolin in central and southern New South Wales. Looking at uh, three different climate models and we're only looking at the 2030 as a, as a decision period that farmers are probably going to be more concerned with than the really longer term change. Uh, and the other focus for the day is really around mixed farming systems and because mixed farming systems are a really dominant form of agricultural land use uh, in New South Wales and lots of areas in Australia and there are a lot of complex links between cropping and livestock that can be glossed over. So in terms of how we go about this sort of work, so it's basically a case study approach that we use. Uh, we've, firstly, the, the first important part of that is to actually uh, consider what's happening with the current climate and the way we go about that is actually going out and actually talking with either farmer groups or farm advisors to actually develop a bit of a baseline about what this farming system looks like. We then actually try to represent that farming system within a model uh, and in this case uh, the model we're talking about is actually one that, that CSIRO has developed called OzFarm which actually picks up um, APSOM which most people will be aware of in terms of crop production and also grass grow in terms of livestock production. Um, and so we, we're really using that and valid, trying to actually validate that farming system in that particular area 
uh, and looking at whether do the yields make sense, does the production make sense, is this the right number of stock, those sort of things. I sort of, uh, this is somewhat, while well, I've got the Osfarm model described there as a car, as a, as a computer, you could easily describe it as a car. Uh, essentially, Syro uh, in their factory uh, develops a car. Um, we go and uh, hire the car from Syro and we take it for a tour and we actually see how good the car is. Um, we test it out. Sometimes we find the car needs a bit more work, needs a bit more engineering. Uh, sometimes there's some operator error. We've got a fatigued driver at the wheel that um, hasn't got, all, got, his, got their hands on the right controls. So, and, and often the case though, there is you know, some good collaboration and actual development of something better. And, um, and so it's really been, it's been an important part of our work is to be working with Syro closely on the development of Ausfarm and, and applying that to different farming systems, particularly mixed farming systems where it's got a capacity to actually represent some of these interactions between uh, livestock and, and cropping. So that's what we do all for the current, and that's really around, you know, try and actually reflect what's happening there. In terms of climate change, uh, what we're introducing is another climate scenario. So after we've uh, tested the car, ran it around the, the racetrack of climate variability, we we'll then actually then go and apply it uh, to a different racetrack of climate change. Now that different racetrack is sometimes it's got a bit bump, few bumps in it, uh, maybe a few inclines in it, but we're actually trying to test it out and trying to test out how some of our farming systems perform, both under existing climate variability but then under climate change. So that's the, the basic elements of the Ausfarm model. Um, so the farm management components, uh, we've got some daily climate data going into the model, temperature, rainfall, evaporation, some soil characteristics. Uh, that's actually handled all in Ausfarm. And the key things we're looking at in terms of livestock performance, you know, what's happening with growth rates for lambs, for example, what's happening with weight, condition scores. Crop performance, obviously, you know, crop yield and quality of you know, uh, protein levels, et cetera. And we're also interested about what's happening to the resource base, you know, what's happening in terms of ground cover, um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I guess the key thing as well is looking at what, what's happening on a farm profit side. So the couple of, um, a couple of sites we're looking at is Condo uh, and Tamora. So the Condoble and one is a sort of 4,000 hectare farm, uh, wheat barley rotation uh, with pasture, it's merino ewes, the pasture is sort of loosened, some medic, some subclover, and sort of 404 mils of annual rainfall. Uh, when we go to Tamora, it's east of, east of Condoblin, a smaller farm size, we've got canola in a rotation, uh, we've also got slightly higher annual rainfall. In terms of the projections we're looking at, I'm just going to cover, there's three GCMs, and why we use different GCMs is because the different GCMs give you different outputs, and we're trying to actually test how robust the system is. So it's important to look at um, more than one climate model. Uh, so these, these uh, the climate models we're using here are from based on the RCP, the 4.5 emission scenario. Um, and we can see from here that we've actually got both a, a change in temperature. So we're looking at these models are giving a, a, a warmer annual mean temperature and also giving us a different gap between rainfall and evapotranspiration. So in terms of uh, when we look at some of the impacts, when we run some of those climate change models with our uh, farm system, we then actually can have a look at what the impacts are. So over here on the left, uh, we've got condoblin. Uh, the base case uh, is there, and we've got, this is for the livestock component, this is for the cropping component, and this is for the farm component. So condo is a sort of drier site, it's impacted by climate change. Livestock, one of those scenarios, a Hadley model, you particularly get quite a large change in returns. Uh, crop, you get a fairly consistent change in returns. Uh, nose actually also get increased variability. And then for a whole farm, when you're putting those two together, that's what the situation looks like. You know, Tamora, it's actually much a, it's a far less clearer um, uh, set of results. Uh, you've got another big impact there from the Hadley model. Uh, so livestock returns are particularly affected and cropping, you know, some actually, in some cases, you're actually better off under this, under climate change and then the farm level. 
then you've got to look at, once you have looked at those results, you're really looking at well, what's driving them. So saying, just in picking up an example from the Condobolin area, um, you know, one of the key things that's actually happening is um, we need to actually increase supplementation of stock. So there's more feed being fed to stock, more grain supplementation. And so you can see from that under the base cases there, we've actually had to feed the stock more often under those climate change scenarios. Down the bottom here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but ground cover levels have actually de declined under each of those scenarios. Uh, Tamora, again, it's a similar story in terms of livestock at least. Uh, level of supplementation has had to increase under those climate change scenarios. And again, with ground cover, uh, there's been some reduction in ground cover levels. Okay, so that's, that's just really looking at the impacts without any adaptation, and then we can go back and actually run our models again with some adaptation options. Uh, and as Mark had indicated, there's a whole range of different adaptation options that farmers can, uh, farmers can adopt, particularly in mixed farming systems. You know, they can change the ratio of crops and livestock. They can look at the length of the fallow period. They can look at some of the in-crop options in respect to fertiliser fertilizer rates, uh, varieties, um, sowing times, you know, sowing, sowing triggers. There's a whole range of different, different options. Today I'm just going to really quickly cover just, just a few of those. So one of the adaptation options we looked at was rather than saying a crop in every single year, um, actually when you get to the end of the, end of the cropping window um, and uh, there's insufficient soil moisture to, have a, to likely have a reasonable crop, we actually then say, well, let's not, let's not sow. That's one of the options. Another option was uh, basically selecti selecting uh, rams that have got high genetic potential and actually result in a higher turnoff rate of lambs, a high growth rate for lambs. Another one was to what would happen if we actually lower the, uh, the, the minimum ground cover threshold. So basically running the system a bit harder, not supplementary feeding as much um, and running it down. Just having a look at one of those options. Um, at Condo, for example, when you do the tactical sowing, probably not surprisingly, the actual average yield increases by doing that because you, you're not sowing uh, as often. You, in a few of those marginal years, you're not putting a crop in. Again, with uh, tomorrow, it's a similar sort of thing down here where we're actually getting a, an improvement in average yield by not sowing. So the key thing is, then, well, what's that mean, though, in terms of returns? So here, again, it's just looking at the Condoblin set of results. Uh, you can see that under the base, this is our, our base case scenario here. Uh, with, uh, with this the CCSM climate scenario, we end up with worse off. Oh, sorry. With the, um, so with the sowing option, you know, not actually sowing every single year, actually slightly, you slightly improve returns. Again, the genetics option, and these are all just looking at these ones independently, so they would stack up a, to be a bit higher than this. The genetics option, you get a, again, you get an improvement. Um, in the Hadley scenario, which is all the ones in blue, we do get an improvement uh, from the base case going up to implementing the sowing option and a, again a, a slight improvement over the base case when you look at the genetic, genetic option. Uh, when you look though under the, uh, the Implank uh, scenarios, the adaptation option is not really giving you much at all. So that's one thing we have been finding is some of the adaptation options work differently in different environments. So it's very hard to make generalisations that this adaptation option is going to work in this environment. You've really got to do the analysis. So just some uh, quick results in terms of the adaptation. So in terms of sowing, yes, overall it's positive um, uh, for both the sites we looked at, for Tamora and Condoblin, and the returns marginally improved, but that higher yield actually does trade off with less sown area if you've got, if you don't, don't sow as often. The genetics was a positive adaptation option um, driven by faster land finishing times and it returned, the average returns improved. Um, the ground cover option, no notable impact on returns at all from the ground cover or, uh, or supplementary feed. It didn't really provide any, any bonus and if anything it would actually just run down the resource base and make it, you know, might sort of raise some questions about the sustainability of the system. Okay, so just quickly, I've only got a few minutes, but there's this interesting debate, I guess, about with adaptation. And on one side, you've got, you think, okay, you could be quite optimistic about this. The ag sector has actually, uh, you know, performed incredibly well. 
over an extended period of time, which sort of suggests that really farmers are a fantastic managed variability and, and adapt quickly. And so that gives you a bit of confidence about the sort of future. Um, and many studies suggest, and, and Mark raised some of these, that, you know, some of these incremental adaptation options, you know, do work. Farmers can implement them and they do make a difference. So that's on the, I guess, on the sort of positive side. But then when you look on the, on the challenger side, you know, so there's uncertainty and the, you can have some uncertainty in the observations. And so try and actually really pick out, particularly with rainfall, is this a trend? Is this a real trend we're observing or is this just natural noise of climate variability? That creates some uncertainty. There's obviously uncertainty in the modelling. Um, and when you look at the climate change modelling, you've got this cascading uncertainty. You're not, not quite sure about what the GHG emissions path you're actually you're going to end up on. There's uncertainty, obviously, in climate models, what the regional scenarios look like, how the impact's been addressed, how they then scale down to local impacts, and then what some of the adaptation options are. So there's a lot of uncertainties, whether, you know, whether you're trying to actually base things off modelling or whether you're looking at some of the observations. Uh, one useful, and this is really from the economics literature, but it, it does line actually up quite nicely with a few things that, that Mark said. Uh, going over to the, on the left-hand side on the current, you know, there are opportunities in here that we can do now. You know, we, can, you know, we can try to pursue some of these low regret sort of options, some of these incremental adaptation options, and that'll get us part of the way. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity to actually mainstream um, particularly some of the work that we're doing looking at some of these different farming systems and how can you tweak the system to improve things. I think there are some good opportunities there and I think there's probably even more opportunities in, particularly in, um, in state departments and other groups as well, is to actually look at some of the management practices and technologies that we're developing and actually seeing how they perform, A, under climate variability and B, under, under some climate change. You know, are, these good, are these good options? And so there's, and that requires a bit of modelling to be able to do that. Um, and you know, an important part is, and I was pleased to hear Joel say this, I guess just in terms of the resolution of some of the climate forecasts and probably also better in terms of monitoring, you know, monitoring some of our rainfall, getting much better resolution about some of that and, and being able to provide predictions at a finer resolution than before. So it's a lot of things we can actually do um, you know, now, and so in those green, that's sort of the, the act now. As we sort of get further, further along, we've got to sort of, you know, do this adaptive management and respond as, as those risks evolve. But it really, it, it reinforces the need to actually have some of that monitoring and stuff actually in place. And so we need to invest in some of that so we can actually adapt over time. So as a quick summary, so the impact assessment, Mixed farming systems, at least from what we've done in New South Wales, and I presented two, we've actually got 19 of these farming systems that we've developed, very much in collaboration with, with CSIRO and with different farming groups. They are sensitive to some of the changing climates. Um, I think our, you know, one of the, the great things has actually happened recently with, I guess, better data sets, increasing computer power, we can actually represent these systems far better than we ever could before. And it's much better to run experiments and actually test out these systems in a computer environment than actually obviously on the farm. So we see that as you know, really quite important. Um, I guess some of the results we found to date, look at not only at a couple of ones I've mentioned today, but, but other case studies is, it seems like those drier, more western sites are impacted by climate change more than some of the cooler, wetter sites. Yeah. And there's, there's probably less things you can do in, in some of the adaptation options further west and dry compared to back over further east when you know, higher rainfall. Um, so the, in terms of the adaptation options, yeah, when we look at our first run of that, let's look at the biophysical impacts, and that really sets the context to considering what, what changes we need in the system. Uh, the incremental adaptation options work. Um, they help reduce the impacts, but to varying extents. There's no hard and fast rule that this adaptation option is going to work in all these different environments. I think the good thing about mixed farming systems, there's lots of levers to pull. Um, there's lots of options you can do to actually modify the system. And with some of our modelling, we can actually look at tweaking some of those. Um, and yeah, exploring some of the consequences of, you know, of tweaking those things is actually really can be quite, quite effective at doing that in a modelling environment. So some of the future work, the last slide is really, uh, obviously we want, we'd like to see improved climate model outputs. 
Um, one thing that we haven't, well, there has been not a lot of work done. I was really looking at what's, what's the impacts of climate change on things like spread, spread of pest, poison, and disease. That's a little bit of an unknown. And a lot of our models are not, don't actually represent some of those challenges. Um, obviously, there's a potential look at a whole, whole range of different adaptation options uh, and to do more integrated assessment of those options. I think it's a big question about how we, you know, trying to better represent some of the economic effects of the options as well. Um, even considering things about, you know, uh, equity, equity levels, because low equity levels suggest you're actually more exposed to change. And so that might change really what you want to want to do. So we need to reflect on that. Um, and I think there is a real opportunity to mainstream some of the analysis that we actually do uh, and apply that to sort of propose new practices. And whether we, we can evaluate those under under recent climate variability, and we can do it for sort of you know as Mark was suggesting about looking at sort of ten years ten year moving averages as an adaptive management. We can look at you know, how some of those new technologies or practices that we're working on, how they can actually, how do they perform under those, under climate variability and also under, under sort of climate change. Uh, so that was it. Thanks very much.